This is the opposite of what we're told nowadays. Follow your heart. Follow your feelings. Your, follow your truth. Your truth changes from one hour to the next, depending on whether the air con is working or not. Right? So, <laughs> so, but follow your truth is the opposite of following hikmah. Hikmah means I've made a decision to follow something. Whether it gets easy or it gets difficult, I'm sticking with it. This new short series is based on the findings of Dr. Saqib Hussain in his PhD thesis, Wisdom in the Quran, which was summarized and presented by Ustad Norman in front of a live audience. The link to the full paper is in the description. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم هو الذي بعث في الأمين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد everybody السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته um, i was expecting to see about 10% of you today but somehow you have made the decision again may allah make it easy for all of us to get through the evening and i pray that you're able to retain your concentration and be able to benefit from this discussion i want to start by saying I felt the need to do this lecture series because I think this is one of the most fundamental teachings of Islam that is not focused on. We're not we're not emphasizing this teaching and by the end of this program tonight I'm hoping you realize the value and the importance of hikmah and why it's like I said at the beginning yesterday why it's not some additional nice to have kind of thing some additional extracurricular thing in the study of Islam, it's actually something that binds all of the teachings of Islam together. The word hikmah is associated as a verb with ihkam. Ihkam means stitching together or tightening together. Remember I told you about the jawbone yesterday that holds the face together? This is the same way Allah says about the Quran, uhkimat ayatuhu, from the same origin. The ayat of the Quran were stitched together. So you have to look at the ayat of the Quran as bound together. Ihkam in Arabic means you take a rope and you tighten it. You tighten it. And something that is well secure is something that is mustahkam. It's mustahkam. And from it comes the idea of even the word hukum, which means to make a verdict that's very well thought out. And from it comes the idea also of wisdom, which is based on knowledge and thinking that is secure. It's well thought through. It's not just a feeling you had and you just decided to do it. This is the opposite of what we're told nowadays. Follow your heart. Follow your feelings. Your, follow your truth. Your truth changes from one hour to the next, depending on whether the air con is working or not. Right? So, <laughs> so, but follow your truth is the opposite of following hikmah. Hikmah means I've made a decision to follow something. Whether it gets easy or it gets difficult, I'm sticking with it. Because I have this secure mind made up to follow through. The reason I'm bringing this up in the introduction again is... In the Qur'an, uh, something I won't get to talk to you about in detail, but it's there in my lectures on Surah Al-Jumu'ah, is that thousands of years ago, Ibrahim salam finished building the Kaaba, and when he finished building the Kaaba, he made a dua alongside his son, Ismail. And he prayed that people should come to this house, and they should worship this house that's been built for the worship of one true God. And then he prayed that from their children, meaning the children of Ibrahim and Ismail, Ya Allah, raise one messenger from among our children. From the line of Ismail. Because Ibrahim salam has another child also, Ishaq. And he has, Ishaq has Yaqub, Yaqub has Yusuf, and so on and so on and so on. Prophets, 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 prophets. On the other side, he has, Ibrahim has a son named Ismail salam, And he says, Ya Allah, send one messenger among these, my children from this line. What will he do? Yatlu alayhim ayatika. He will read your ayat onto you. Wa yu'allimuhum al kitaba wal hikma. And he will teach them the book and what did you hear? And wisdom and hikmah. Ibrahim alayhi salam, thousands of years ago, after going through all the tests that he went through, every test that he went, and Allah told him, I am making you an imam over people. 
I'm making you a leader. He passes the hardest test that any prophet is ever given. And then Allah rewards him by giving him the responsibility of building the Kaaba. Then he asked Allah, Ya Allah, make this a place where everybody can come. The people that live here, make them safe, provide for them. Allah says, no, I won't. Some of your children will not be believers and I'm not going to give them, I'm not guaranteeing anything for your bad kids. لا ينال عهد الظالمين Then Ibrahim alayhi even though he did so much, now he asked Allah dua and Allah said, I'm only accepting it partially, not fully. Then Ibrahim alayhi salam makes another dua, right? And so he, he, he changes his dua a little bit, right? And he, as he adjusts his dua, he finally gets to the final version of that dua, which Allah then accepts. And that accepted dua was, Ya Allah, among my children, give them a messenger who will read your ayat, teach them the book and the wisdom, and he will purify them. And he, thousands of years ago, Allah accepted that dua from him, that finally a prophet will come that will teach his people the book and wisdom. The reason, if, if Ibrahim salam is important to us, then wisdom is important to us. You understand? This is a religion of the book and the wisdom. It's, it's, what, it's what's carried from that time that that dua is echoed and then it's coming to our messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And Allah says, Allah did a favor on the believers. لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ When he raised a messenger from among them, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ He recites the ayat to them, he purifies them, he teaches them the law, he teaches them wisdom. Meaning Allah answered the prayer of Ibrahim alayhi salam by sending Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. Okay? So the reason I wanted to tell you that is, there's four things the Prophet does. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ He recites the ayat. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ He purifies them. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ He teaches the law. وَالْحِكْمَةِ He teaches wisdom. What's the last item? What's the fourth item? Wisdom. It's as if wisdom is the thing that ties everything else together. It's like, you know, you put bricks together, but the bricks cannot stay together until you put cement in between. The cement that holds the entire religion together is actually hikmah. Hikmah is the thing that binds, and its meaning is to secure something and bind something. And if we don't pay attention to hikmah, then the other parts of our religion, they start falling apart, and some people hold on to this brick, some people hold on to that brick, some people hold on to that brick. You understand? And what happens in the religion then? Some people just recite the ayat. They just recite the ayat. They don't have anything else to do with the religion. Other people say, no, I just want to purify myself. I want to purify my heart. That's all I care about. I don't care about anything else. My heart, my heart, and my heart. Other people say, no, you have to learn fiqh. You have to learn the law. That's all this religion. All it is is the rules. You just have to know the rules. So what happens? People pick one piece. People pick another piece. People pick another piece. And what does hikmah do? It brings them together and it binds them and you, you create the perfect balance between all of the teachings of the religion. That's why hikmah is so important. And you can feel if you observe what's happening in the way that we carried out our religion, the way you observe the Islam around the world, may Allah protect all of the Muslims and guide all of us. You know, you can feel how disconnected the religion became, how we started holding on to pieces of it. Some people this piece, some people that piece, some people that piece. And it became this disjointed thing. And then you start realizing maybe the thing missing is a, is a conversation and a re-revived re awareness of hikmah. Now, that's the introductory comment. Now I'm going to get to something that I talked to you about yesterday with Dawud alayhi salam and briefly with Luqman radiallahu anhu. I'm not going to go into detail about them because my plan is when I do a deeper look study of Surah Luqman, deeper look study of Surah Saad, when I talk about Hikmah, when I talk about you know, Luqman, then I'll talk about them in, in more detail. But the things I want you to know for this discussion are as follows. From Dawood we learn, alayhi salam, that you have to think about life experience seriously. You have to learn from what happened in your life. And you have to observe the world. You have to know what's going on in the world. If he didn't observe what was going on in the world, he would never have been able to say, he wouldn't be able to say that. It's his observation of the world around him. So we 
the, what does that mean for us? It's not, when, when somebody says, I take my Islam very seriously, it doesn't just mean I'm going to pick up Islamic books and learn Islamic books. Or I'm going to study Tajweed, I'm going to memorize the Quran. That's Islam too. That's a pursuit of wisdom also. But you know what's equally a pursuit of wisdom together with that? Sociology, political science, history, anthropology, global economics, international relations, all that stuff. Law, ethics, all that, and psychology, counseling. All these fields now become part of the pursuit of hikmah. You see that? So this is pretty serious because people say, Oh, I want to study deen. I don't want to study dunya. That statement is lacking in hikmah and is lacking in an understanding of the definition of hikmah in the Qur'an. Okay, so that's one. The second is contemplating spiritual and moral principles. That's in the teachings of Luqman. What Allah has taught us through the story of Luqman, a person can think deeply and they will realize there is such a thing as a God and one must be grateful to that God. There is such a thing as an afterlife and everything I do has consequences and I should treat people the right way. These basic ideas are not coming from revelation. It's a truth that is inside every human being. And if they really deeply look within themselves and the world around them and contemplate, spiritually contemplate, they will arrive at that conclusion. You know, a lot of times there are, Muslim, there are non-Muslims who arrive at these conclusions. Like Luqman did. He wasn't exposed to revelation and he arrived at these conclusions. This is, Luqman is almost like Allah celebrating people that are officially non-Muslim, but they have refigured Islam out without ever meeting a prophet. Right? That's what the Quran has done here. It's pretty amazing. So Allah is saying there are people in the world that can find out about Allah. They can find out that there is something called the judgment day. I know I need to be treating people the right way. They've reached that basic level of wisdom on their own without any revelation. And a lot of those people, you know what happens with them? We find out about them that when they heard about Islam or they read the Quran or they, they studied a little bit, they become Muslim. And when they become Muslim, if you survey and interview hundreds of them, thousands of them, one of the common things you will find among them is they say it felt like something I already knew. They say it felt like it's not, it wasn't something new. It was already something inside me. And it's just like, oh, this is what I believed all along. You know, in the, the Quran literally says about some Christians who when they heard about Islam and they started crying, they heard the Quran and they started crying and they became Muslim. But what they said is so fascinating. They said, Inna kunna min qablihi muslimin. We were already Muslim before this. We just did. It's as if they're saying, we didn't even know that, the, that we were Muslim before this. And this is a pretty important fact of the Quran because now I don't look at everybody in the world as, oh, um, you see a Muslim, oh, Jannah people, Jannah people, Jannah people. And then you see non-Muslims in the grocery store, oh, Jahannami, Jahannami, Jahannami. Right? This guy is ready for the barbecue. I don't see that because I don't know where they are inside in their journey. I don't know where they are. That's with them and with Allah. So my concern about what's going to happen with this person or that person, because a lot of people say, with that in mind, what's going to happen to all the non-Muslims? Really? Because on judgment day, before Allah starts judging you, you're going to be like, ek, ek second, ya Allah, ek second. What about all the non-Muslims? Can you help me with that first? Because I know it's pretty serious right now and the mountains have melted and the oceans are boiling over and all that stuff, but I'm really concerned. This is my question. Can you help me with that? Oh, also, I, I was wondering about dogs. What happens to dogs? Are they going to be hot? Dogs? Uh, anyway, anyway. So the, 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 the point is, what is the Qur'an teaching us? You don't know who's on a journey towards a wisdom that is actually endorsed by Allah Himself. You don't know that. So our religion made us humble to the journey of those who haven't outwardly accepted Islam yet. We don't even know about them. And it, it made us humble towards them and even acknowledge that Allah can give them wisdom also. They can have wisdom also. And that's, that's kind of captured and encapsulated in the story of Luqman. Okay. So now let's move forward. This is a summary of what we finished up yesterday. Now, there's one item which is an overlap. Um, this is something I'll talk about in detail. And this is, again, due thanks to Dr. Saqib Hussain. I think he's in the audience here somewhere. Uh, Saqib's a dear friend of mine. I consider him a younger brother. And by the way, this most of what I'm sharing with you, I think 99% is what I mean by most. 
is based on uh, his work. I'm actually doing no justice to his PhD thesis on Hikmah in the Quran. I mentioned that to you yesterday. I, we put a QR code on the screen before. We'll put it on the break also so you can download his paper. It's six years of hard work. Uh, the, those 343 pages that I'm going through are, and I'm reading it, I'm like, this is a lot of work. And every chapter I go through, I'm like, each chapter is a book by itself. And I'm just so like grateful to people, young men and women like that, that dedicated themselves to studying something so deeply and putting so much hard work in. To And, and the love of Quran just shows on every page. It just shows. And those, you know, I want you guys to know there's people like me that show up on YouTube videos and YouTube shorts and Instagram reels. And apparently I'm on TikTok also. I didn't know that I was. And like, there's people like that. And then there's the people that do such enormous work. And the vast majority of Muslims don't see that. They don't see that they've done an amazing contribution to and a service to the deen. So I want to take a pause for a moment, and I'd like you guys to help me give Saqib a huge round of applause for the work that he's done in service of Allah's book. I, I love you, Saqib, and I'm, I'm very, very proud of you. Okay. Anyway, so... Um, okay, you can sound now. Okay. Join the party late. One guy was sleeping this whole time, and he just woke up and like, oh, okay. Okay, just, okay. So there's two people I talked about that kind of had wisdom that wasn't revelation-based wisdom. Of course, Dawood is a prophet, alayhi salam, but the wisdom that Allah talked about was experience-based, not revelation-based. And the wisdom of Luqman is also, in a sense, life experience and contemplation-based, not revelation-based. What's really interesting is, before Islam, Luqman was a famous person that was referenced among, among the Arabs. You know how like when you talk about a genius, you're like, oh, look, Einstein over here. You know how we say that? And Einstein became kind of a word for a genius, right? Or somebody speaks really good English. Oh, look at that, Shakespeare. You know, so when we do that, we, we, we take these people and we make them coined phrases. Like that, when someone's super wise or really well-spoken among the Arabs, they'd be like, oh, ho, look at that, Luqman, huh? Like that's, that, that's what they would do. Luqman was like an expression for someone who's really wise, really well-spoken, a really good judge in the story about Luqman among them, according to some, he's from Ad. They would make poetry about him. And they would make references to him. He was a king and he was also very wise, right? And he would solve a lot of disputes. What's interesting is the story of Dawood in the Quran has some connection to how the Arabs used to think about Luqman. Why? Because Dawood is also a king and Luqman was also a king. Dawood is also wise, according to the Quran, and Luqman, according to the Arabs, is also wise. And then, they uh, Dawood dealt with groups of people that were arguing with each other, khasm. And in poetry, you find Luqman is dealing with people that have arguments with each other, and he's helping make judgments between them with khasm. Same word in poetry in Arabic, before Islam. And similarly, he, he's described, uh, uh, Dawood was described with really powerful speech, faslul khitab. And even before Islam, Fasli Khitabih al Hakima was used to describe Luqman. Luqman was really powerful in the way he expressed himself. Almost the same expression that the Quran used was already used for who? For Luqman. And finally, we see Hikmah being used for Dawud alayhi salam and Hukuma, another word for wisdom, being used in poetry for Luqman. Now, the reason I'm saying that is it's interesting that the Quran already knows that the Arabs, when they hear these words, they know famous poems about Luqman. And so Allah wants to make a connection between Dawood and who? Dawood and Luqman. And it's pretty cool that later on when Allah talks about Luqman, there's a connection also between Dawood and Luqman in the Quran. So he, what Allah is doing is, He's acknowledging the culture of the Arabs, the poetry of the Arabs, the art of the Arabs, the storytelling of the Arabs, and He's using that to communicate with them. And this is an important wisdom of the Quran. If you want to communicate with someone, you should know something about their culture. If you want to effectively get through to somebody, you should know something about their history, something about you know how they're what they're like, you know what their what their language is like, and language changes so quickly, right? So the language of uh, you know my language, apparently English, is not the same as Gen Z language. No cap, it's not the same. 
Okay, it's, it, there, that's a different language altogether. If, when I was in high school and somebody said no cap, I said it's not allowed in school. I don't know what you want me to do. You know, the, I thought they're talking about a kufi or something else, but the, the, the language and expression changes. So if you're like, you want to talk to the youth or you want to talk to this group or that group, you need to know something about their culture. You need to know something about them and something about the way they communicate with each other, right? And that's, again, a kind of an embedded wisdom that we're being taught. Okay, let's move on. Now we're going to get to the juicy part. I promised you juicy parts today. Surah Al-Isra. Surah Al-Isra is Surah number 17. This is a place in the Quran that's very important if you're a student of this subject. I want to know what wisdom means. I want to know what wisdom means according to the Quran. One of the most important places you will go to is going to be Surah Al-Isra, ayahs number 23 to 40. Here Allah will make a list of things and at the end of that list of things He will say, ذَلِكَ مِمَّا أَوْحَى إِلَيْكَ رَبُّكَ مِنَ الْحِكْمَةِ That is what your master revealed to you from hikmah. Meaning this list of stuff is all what? Hikmah according to the Qur'an. Now before I, I get into hikmah, the, the passage, I want you to know what we're about to read. By the way, let me see if you remember. What ayat of the Qur'an were you going to talk about? Surah what? Surah what? Surah Al-Isra 17, ayahs number what? 23 to 75, very good, very good. 17 to 23. Wow, Manchester. 23 to 40, that's better, yeah. Some of you who said the wrong answer, you should have seen the look of disappointment by the person next to you. When you, sh when you said 17 to 75, the person is like, you're making us all look bad. <laughs> What I want, have you ever heard of the Ten Commandments? Okay, the, 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 Moses was given the Ten Commandments, right? What you might not know is over the course of Jewish history, there were different versions of the Ten Commandments. It went through different edits. So they didn't have this, you know, you have at least three different versions over the course of history of the, of the same Ten Commandments. These ayat, 23 to 40, is the Quran's reconstruction of the Ten Commandments given to Musa. It's actually the Qur'an's version of the Ten Commandments. So this, these Ten Commandments over time, uh, this, is, this is a statement I'm taking from his paper. Philo's is, is he's a theologian, a philosopher, a Jewish philosopher. His presentation of the law of Musa as both natural and wise has been well documented. There's a book that's about this subject, meaning they're saying that these Ten Commandments in the Bible are wisdom. Their wisdom. And Allah will say about that same passage, at the end He will say, this is what I have given to you from what? Wisdom. So the, the Jews have been saying this, and now the Qur'an is saying, by the way, what you have had all along, you, you had one version, then you edited it, then you edited it. By the way, you don't need any more edits. I'm giving you the final version of what hikmah is. So it's like it went through multiple uh, evolutions. Like you know how software gets updated? This is the final update and that's the Qur'an. So the Qur'an is not even presenting itself as a new religion to the Jews. It's saying it's the final update to the revelation that you've had all along. That's how it's presenting itself, which is pretty cool. Okay. Now, again, it was equated to biblical wisdom. Wisdom becomes possible with the Sabbath. Now, this is, one of the Ten Commandments used to be that you will observe the Sabbath. Anyone know, any, anybody know what the Sabbath is? It's Saturday. It's Saturday. Okay, so... The, uh, the majority of the Jewish community around the world, the Orthodox Jewish community for thousands of years, they've celebrated the Sabbath. What, they mean, what that means is they don't do any work or any business or anything else on Saturday. And there was a question about why don't they do that? And there's an answer to that that we don't agree with. One answer to that that's even in Jewish literature is on the se God created the heavens and the earth in six days. And on the seventh day, he... Rested, and some even added their own tafsir to that in Jewish literature and said, and after he was done with his rest, he felt refreshed. That's what they add, right? And what does the Quran do? The Quran responds to that and says, Walam ya bi hinna. Allah says, He created the skies and the earth and He never got tired from creating them. He was never exhausted. So Allah responds to that, that belief that they have. So what does the Quran do? The Quran doesn't say, You're wrong. The Quran just <laughs> corrects them just naturally just fixes it, just takes one statement that they misspoke and he corrects it with the right statement and he just moves on instead of dwelling on the debate. 
That's one of the one of the great features of the Quran. But then they developed other ideas of why is the Sabbath so important, other than the rest. They said it took six days to create the skies and the earth, right? So when the six days were done, now creation is complete. And you know in the Quran, we have to contemplate Allah's creation, right? We have to contemplate the mountain, the sky, the bird, the camel, etc., etc. Well, their idea became, some of their idea became, well, six days, the creation is now complete. The seventh day should be dedicated every week for just contemplation. You should just contemplate the creation of Allah and contemplate what God did. So it's a day for tadabbur. It's a day for reflection. When Allah gave the final update to the Ten Commandments, which is what we're about to read, is there mention of the Sabbath or no? What do you think? The Quran will say observe the Sabbath or no? Please get the right answer for this one. No. Okay. <laughs> so this whole, it seems as though if the reason for the Sabbath is you should be looking for wisdom on the Sabbath, now that's been taken out. It's been replaced. The question is, well, what replaced it? Well, the, the answer to that is the Quran itself replaced it. The Quran itself made contemplation and reflection a constant part of the believer's life. Five times a day, we're reciting and supposed to be contemplating the Quran as we're saying the words of Allah ourselves. Okay? All right. So now, uh, I'm going to skip this part a little bit, but I'll briefly mention because that's a lot of reading. I, I, I'm sharing this slide with you so you can read this on your own. I'll give you some examples of what Allah says. Allah says you should be the best to your parents in this passage. One of the wisdoms. You should be the best you can be to both your parents. And then he says, lower your wings of humility before them. That's what Allah says. So who is Allah comparing me to when he says lower your wings? He's comparing me to a bird. And what's really interesting is in Proverbs, or in Decalogue, this is a reference from biblical literature, there's a huge parable of parents and children and the relationship to a bird in the nest. It's a huge long paragraph and the Quran summarized all of it just by saying, lower your wings of humility. And that this is a, what I've put here is a reference to the full text of that parable. Now, uh, similarly, something interesting happens. In the Bible, in the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt not steal. You will not steal. But in this passage, Allah will not say don't steal. He won't say that. There's no, it's gone. But instead of not stealing, he says, don't walk with arrogance in the world. Don't, so the stealing got replaced with what? Arrogance. Arrogance in society. Walk around with arrogance. Walk around with arrogance means wherever you go, you're arrogant. What's really interesting in the Bible is they talk about, in this passage, they talk, I'll actually read it to you quickly. The third commandment in the second, fi uh, in the second five forbids stealing. For he who gapes after what belongs to others is the common enemy of the state, willing to rob all, but able only to filch from some, because while his covetousness, covetousness extends indefinitely, his feeble capability cannot keep pace with it, but restricted to a small compass, reaches only to a few. Let me put that in normal English for you now, because you understood nothing. Okay? What he's saying is, thieves, thieves, are so greedy and so arrogant, they don't care about anybody. They just take whatever they want from whoever they want. But even thieves are weak. So they can only steal as far as their hands can reach. But if their hands could reach more, they would do what? They would steal more. And then sometimes these people that have that thieving, arrogant mentality that doesn't care about anyone, sometimes they become kings. And when they become kings, they steal and rob for millions of people because their hand is more extended. So the Bible made a connection between why are people stealing? Because they are what? Arrogant. And what did the Quran do? He, the Quran goes to the root problem and says, don't be arrogant because if you're not arrogant, then you'll never even think about dismissing somebody else's right and stealing. You won't even go in that direction. You see that? So the Quran went to the root of the problem in doing that, okay? A similar thing that happens is the, the Bible says you will not give false testimony. Like you're not going to lie in court or you're not going to say, oh yeah, that's really bad. Oh, I know about that. And you have no idea about that, right? You're not going to just hear something and then present it as fact, you know? So what does the Quran do? It says, لا تخفو ما ليس لك به علم. Don't follow something you don't have knowledge of. So instead of saying, don't give false testimony in this passage, Allah says, don't pursue something 
don't follow something if you yourself don't have direct knowledge. Where does false testimony come from? People testifying to something that they actually don't know. Isn't that where it comes from? So he goes again to the root of the problem. And now here's a summary of this passage. This is, some, this is a homework assignment for you. Because this work is not just me coming and giving a lecture. This is you engaging with your journey with the Qur'an. So this, these ayat, 17, 23 to 40, you're going to study them on your own. But I'll tell you one, one or two quick things about them. The first most important teaching is do right by Allah. Be right with God. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ Allah declared that you will not worship anybody except Him. That's number one. Now, let me tell you something you might, may not have thought about. What is proof that someone worships God? Practical proof. You know, there's spiritual proof that's in your heart. Practically, what's the proof? Prayer? Sure. Prayer is proof that you worship only God. You take shahada, that's proof that you worship only one God. You're, you're dressed in hijab, it's proof you worship one God. It's visible proof. People at Hajj, proving that they worship only one God. In this passage, Allah says, I want you to worship only me. And then He gives us these instructions. What do these instructions become? Proof that we worship only one God. And if we don't follow these instructions, I'll let you fill in those blanks yourself. There must be some, someone else being worshipped or something else being worshipped. Now let's see what these instructions are. First one is be the best you can possibly be to your parents. That even if they become old. Even if they get really old. One of them or both of them. Don't complain to them. And speak to, and, and speak to them. And don't be harsh with them when you speak to them. Don't get frustrated and raise your voice with them. Mom! Baba, just enough, okay? Enough. Got the same thing every time. Some of your dads, right? They have like four or five stories. They tell it every Dawat. And everywhere they go, they tell the same story. Same exact one. And you know, it, it begins the same way every time. And you're sitting there having a normal conversation. And your dad steps in and says, You know, in Bahawalpur, and you're like, oh. And your mom is like, <sighs> or you look down on your phone and you get agitated. We get, our parents get on our nerves. They get annoying. Why does he do that every time? Why does mom do that? Why does dad do that? And then uh, what, when parents get older, they get more, not here, in Manchester, the parents are amazing. This is, this is about, this is about Bradford. Everything that... <laughs> so there, these parents, man, they get, so, they get mean, they get easily angry, they start yelling and screaming for no reason, they're so stubborn, they don't want to hear anything, my way or the highway, constantly guilting, and this and that, there's, just so, there's so much wrong with the parents, and then you seek guidance from TikTok, and you find out your parents are toxic, Narcissist, uh, nuclear, uh, radioactive, you know. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, let me see the signs of a narcissist. Baba John, Baba John, Baba John, Baba John. Ba let me see the, the signs of a, of a toxic person. <gasps> my entire khandan is toxic. <laughs> <laughs> and then the... The, you know, the, the, the Lokmans of the TikTok world will tell you, you have to get away from toxic people. You have to set boundaries for toxic people. And you're like, that's it. I'm ready. So you come back and you're like, you know what, mom? I'm setting a boundary. A cha boundary. I'm setting a boundary. And then you find the, the imam or you find, you, you try to DM Mufti Mink or something. And you try to, I have a question. My parents are really toxic and they're really like, what should I do? Now jokes aside, some parents are really messed up. It's a fact. That's a fact. 
But the Quran did something here that I want you to, this is, what, this is one of the most important things for today's discussion. One of the most important. And everything else we study is going to fit with this. I want you to know something. I was going to mention it later, but I'm going to mention it now. I want you to know the difference between law and wisdom. I'll say those two words again. What two words? Law and wisdom. Okay, let me give you easy examples of the law. Uh, five times prayer is what? Is law. Hajj, if you can afford it, is what? Law. Uh, fasting, if you have the health, is what? Law. Fine. These are laws. These are laws. Okay. Stopping at a red light when you're driving is what? It's not wisdom. It's law. It's law. When it says, do not enter at the, at the airport, and it says, secure personnel only, not go, and not going there is you're abiding by what? The law. The law is very clear. It's black and white. Either you broke it or you didn't. It's black and white. It's like math. Okay? You can prove if you broke it and you prove if you didn't break it. Now, let's go through some of these. Do the best you can with your parents. That's what Quran says. Do the best you can with your parents. Can you judge that immediately? Can the best you do with your parents be different from the best someone else does with their parents? Could that be different? It could be, right? The prayers are five for you and the prayers are five for them. The law is the same. But doing the best with your parents. Some people, I had a friend whose mother was so problematic, she was so psychologically uh, abusive that he developed seizures. Like he would be in the presence of his mother and he would start having epileptic seizures, like literal seizures. You know, and he was like medically advised to keep a distance from his mom. And the best he can do for his mom is to stay away from her. He asked me, I told him, the best you can do for now is stay away from her because when she starts abusing you in this way, it's not just that she's hurting you, the angels are documenting this against who? Her. You're saving her from herself. That's the best he can do. In some other cases, there's a mom who got sick. She's paralyzed. She can't do anything. And I need to go help. I need to help. The son needs to go help. The daughter needs to go help and do whatever they can. And, but they have a job and they have kids and they have other responsibilities. So they make whatever time they can to go. And the mom says, this is not enough. I need you here the whole time. And she says, I can't because if I do this the whole time, then I'm not going to be able to pay the rent. I'm not going to be able to be provide for my kids or pay for your care or even take care of you. This is the best that I can do. You know what she's doing? She's living by the ayah. And somebody else who has free time, they have money, they have resources, and they're able to give 10 times more time to their family. So what happens? Some of you, you have your parents back in some other country. You have your parents in Bangladesh. You have your parents in Pakistan. You have your parents in India, Afghanistan. Afghanistan? Okay. 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 Anyway, so the thing is, you have parents back home and you have multiple siblings. One of, one of the brothers stays back home. Back, he's in, back in Pakistan. And some of the brothers, he got into a PhD program. He's studying at Oxford. One of the sisters, she got married. She lives in Australia. One went this way. One went this way. One went this way, right? And they're there. They're studying. They're working. They have a family to take care of all of that. And they're sending money back and they're providing and all of that. And the brother who's at home, right? He says, oh, you people go have all the fun and I have to be over here. You should be here too. You should quit your job. You should do this. You should do that. And now you're like, ah, maybe I should leave everything and maybe I should go back because my parents deserve more. I should quit my job. I should quit my university. I should quit everything because my parents deserve that I should just leave everything and go back to them, right? And the parents themselves are saying, I want you to stay. I don't need you here. But the other siblings are guilting you. They're guilting you. And they're saying, you're not doing your best. You're not doing your best. You know, in these kinds of situations, you know what we've done? We are, we're a culture that has internalized guilt. So you're always assuming you're doing something wrong. Always. You know, the Quran says, I'll give you just one quick example. It's an ayah from Allah that Allah allowed people to put their children on ships. Surah Yaseen, Yaseen Sharif, Pakistanis, Yaseen Sharif. Allah 
Allah, one of Allah's signs is that He allowed people to put their children on what? Ships. Back in the day, when you put your son on a ship, is he going to come back next weekend? When's he going to come back? Never. He's going to go find a new island or a new continent and start a farm there and start trading there and maybe come back in three or four or five years and nobody is guilting him that I'm abandoning my parents. Nobody's doing that. That's in the Quran. It's an ayah from Allah. And this is actually a ni'mah from Allah. Allah says it's one of my ayat that they get to put their kids on board ships. You know what happens? We make it sound make it sound like spending every second you have with your mom and dad is a law. It's not a law, it's what? Wisdom. And wisdom is different from law because wisdom depends on the situation. Your situation is different. The best you can do is different. Somebody else has a different situation. The best they can do is different. You understand? If you say, I just want to spend all my time with my parents, but right now I'm paying for their medical fees. I'm going to quit my job and go massage my mom's feet. You can massage her feet, but now the doctor ain't coming because you ain't got money to pay the doctor, but good luck massaging her feet. No, no, this is what Islam wants. No, you lack basic intelligence. You lack even the most fundamental level of hikmah. You understand? So th this is, these pas this passage, first of all, worship God, do the best you can do with your parents. Then he says, وَآتِي ذَا الْقُرْبَ حَقَّهُ Give the close relatives what they deserve. Give the close relatives what they deserve. <laughs> Some of you are like, I know what they deserve. <laughs> I'll do that today. I've been thinking about that for a while. <laughs> and give those who can't help themselves. Give people who are traveling. Give them their rights. Meaning, don't just deny people help and deny people favors because you don't like them. And it's, it's, it's much easier to like strangers. It's much easier to give qurbani meat to an orphanage in a country and build a well in some village you'll never go to. But it's much harder to give a little bit of your zakat money to your niece or your distant cousin because you hate their guts. That's harder. Allah started with close family and then went further. Then he says, Don't waste money. Don't feel like you have whatever money. You can spend it however you want, whenever you want. Be responsible and frugal with your money. Then he says, and don't be completely, don't be miserly, meaning don't be like, oh no, no, you, you, you go groceries and your kids say, we need bread. You don't need that much bread. We have one slice, one slice left. Break it up into four pieces and you'll, that'll be enough. You need, a, you need to lose weight anyway. Right? This is my, that's one extreme. The other extreme is spend whatever you want. Then Allah teaches you, in Allah yabsutur rizqa li man yasha'u wa yaqdiru. It's a, what, a, what an amazing wisdom. First Allah says, don't be too cheap. Then He says, don't spend too much. Then He says, Allah controls rizq. Sometimes He gives more, sometimes He gives less. Why is this, what's the connection? If you're being cheap, you think if you're being cheap, you'll be able to hold on to more what? More money. Allah says, even if you think you're holding on to more money, Allah can take that away too. You're not the one increasing your risk, Allah is. And if you're spending and spending and spending, and you think, oh, it's okay, I got more, I got more, Allah can contract it whenever He wants. And He can expand whenever He wants. So don't think because of you that's happening, be balanced in the way you use your money. That's, by the way, is money decisions law or wisdom? What do you think? Ah, so you're starting to get it. Laws can be quantified. Wisdom is a very situation by situation decision. And Allah is basically teaching us that human beings are capable of figuring out how to apply wisdom in their situation. What this ayah means for me, these ayat, be the best to my parents, my close relatives, my finances. What it means for me is completely different from what it means for you. Completely different. The ayat are the same, but the situation is entirely different. So the application is entirely different. So you cannot use these ayat and say, this is what I do. And then some people do that. You know, this ayah, I, Alhamdulillah, I live by this ayah so humbly that I talk about it with all of my family and extended. And you should do the same as I do. Because I have, I have figured out hikmah. The rest of you need to get on this train. 
Yeah, that's not what this is. It's individualized. Now, Allah says, uh, you know, أَوْفُوا الْكَيْلَ إِذَا كِلْتُمْ وَزِينُوا بِالْقِصَاصِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Give full weight, and when you weigh, weigh with a balanced scale. What is that referring to? Back in the day, it's referring to people that used to sell rice and bananas and coconuts or whatever they sold. And there, there's the weight on one side and there's the items on the other side, right? So make sure you give exactly what you paid for or what you are being paid for. Now, you could look at this and say, well, I don't work in a grocery store. Uh, I'm a programmer. I'm an accountant. So alhamdulillah, I don't have a scale to deal with. Yes, you do, dummy. This means if you got contracted to do a certain amount of work in a certain amount of hours, don't lie about it. Don't cheat. Don't steal. Is this, again, something that situation by situation, you have to figure out what this means for you and your career? Yeah. And by the way, who's the most qualified to figure out what the right thing to do is? That's going to be a hard question to answer. You. Allah put you in that situation. He made you capable of finding the answer. He made you capable of inquiring and discovering and then abiding by these principles of wisdom. Then he says, don't kill your children because of poverty. This is talking about abortion. Now in the middle of it, there's actually even a law. Okay? So don't, don't cause your children's death because you think you're not going to be able to provide for them. And then he says, don't commit adultery. Don't even go near it. Don't go near zina. Now don't do zina is a law. Don't do zina. لا تزينو, that's a law. But don't go near it is what? Wisdom. Because going near it, somebody's going near it, you can't really catch that. You know, if somebody stopped guarding their eyes or they had a little bit of a conversation, then they had a little bit more of a conversation, then they you, we got together at a coffee shop or whatever, step by step by step, right? And when that happens, you can't stop that at 21 point and say, this is where the haram began. No, no, no. It's nothing. I just, I'm just writing an email. It's just, you know, it's just a smiley face. A smiley face is haram. So what this Allah is teaching us, don't go near it. And then finally, just a few others. Uh, murder retribution, I actually skipped. Uh, so, uh, you know, don't kill an innocent person. That's again, now it's mixing law and wisdom together. Isn't it? And we're going to see that law and wisdom actually get bunched together. Then he says orphan care. You know, make sure you don't take the money of the orphan. Because when, pe when parents, somebody's parents die, they left behind money. And now the kids are too young to manage that money. So you're managing the money for them. But that doesn't mean it's your money. It's actually that child's money. And it, when they're old enough, you're going to pass it on to them. Then so business ethics, pursued without knowledge. And finally, Allah mentions arrogance. وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَةً Don't walk on the earth with arrogance. What do you think that? And he says, إِنَّكَ لَن تَخْرِقَ الْأَرْضِ You're not going to crack the earth but with your walk. You're not so powerful that you'll crack the earth. Now let's think about that for a second. Can you tell if somebody is walking arrogantly? Can, if you can, you have a problem. You can't tell if somebody has arrogance or not. Who's the only one who can truly tell? Not just Allah. Allah definitely. Themselves. Themselves. You're walking with a smile and humility, but it's fake humility. And you're trying to impress upon people how humble you are. Isn't that a form of arrogance? That's itself a form of arrogance. You're looking at people like, <laughs> thanks people. <laughs> but you're not saying it. What you're saying is, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, brother, how are you? Mashallah, alhamdulillah. But in your head, you're like, <laughs> Bradford. <laughs> like, that's what, you're, that's what you're doing in your head. <laughs> you, can't get, you can't catch it. You can't gauge it. This is even talking about the way you talk to people, the way you, your body language, the way you look at people the way you think of people. And it's saying walking around on the earth means wherever you go. You go to the store. Some people go to a restaurant and they act like the Fir'aun has walked into his palace. Excuse me, I've been sitting here for 90 seconds. I'm never coming back here again. And the waiter says, I'm going to pray two rakah of shukan. <laughs> Could you say that again? That felt really good. <laughs> 
observe all of these. The first one was about Allah, right? What's the rest of it about? Well, parents, relatives, travelers, spending, cheapness, wasteful spending, not hurting children, staying away from adultery, murder, orphan care, business ethics, pursuing things without knowledge, not walking arrogantly. What does all of this have to do with? How you deal with people. How's your behavior with people? There's no mention of prayer. There's no mention of fasting. There's no mention of rituals. There's, there's no mention of tahajjud. There's none of that. And at the end of all of it, he says, that is what your master gave you from wisdom. This is wisdom. Is it possible that you have somebody who prays and observes Islamic clothing and learns Islamic knowledge and memorizes the Quran and studies Tajweed and studies Arabic and goes to halaqas and starts halaqas and volunteers at the MSA or puts together, you know, iftars in Ramadan and donates at the masjid, all that stuff. But none of these wisdoms are there. Or many of them are. Is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. They'll recite this passage with perfect tajweed. That's the irony. Right? And, then, and this is our religion. This is hikmah. This is hikmah. Ibrahim salam said, Ya Allah, send them a messenger that will teach them the book and teach them hikmah. And what happened with us? When someone looks on the outside, they look religious. That's religious. But if, and even if none of these things are there, none of these things have to be there. Okay? Now, we're going to quickly talk about Jesus. Okay, I got a few minutes. Before you're five minutes, I'm going to introduce this concept to you. This shouldn't take too long. So, five minutes, I'll give you a first break, inshallah. Okay, so Jesus, wisdom, and the Quran. I want you to know that the Israelites, they were given the Torah. Bani Israel were given the Torah. Which prophet? Was, were, they, were they given Torah through? Musa. So the first prophet of the Israelites from a book perspective is Musa. And the last prophet to the Israelites is Isa. What I want you to know in a summary is the Quran is basically arguing that Musa was given the kitab. Musa was given what? Kitab. The law. And Isa, and actually Dawud and Isa both, but finally Isa was given hikmah. Musa was given kitab and Isa was given hikmah. Now we have to understand the relationship between kitab and hikmah. Because so far, kitab is a separate subject. Hikmah is a separate subject. But now we've got to figure out what's the relationship between both of them, okay? Now, first thing is, even in, in uh, uh, Christian poetry, the Injil, which is the revelation given to Isa, was also called hikmah, okay? And Quran also says, Isa alayhi salam said, I have come to you with hikmah. I have come to you with hikmah and to clarify some of the things you've been disagreeing about. Okay, here's a really interesting thing. Um, you know guys, you guys know who Sam Harris is? Thank you, Saki, for pointing this out to me. I had to share this with everybody. You, know, you guys know who Sam Harris is? Famous atheist? Really interesting figure, talks exhaustively about how absurd belief in God is, etc., etc. He was having a debate with William Lane Craig and he said something. This is a summary of what he said. He said, you know what? You don't need all these religions. I can make a new religion in five minutes. It'll be better than all of them. Okay? Five minutes. Let me show you how. And he says, all you have to do is take the Ten Commandments that are in the Bible and remove the part about making images because the Ten Commandments has a thing about thou shalt not make images of some sort. Get rid of that. That's, nobody needs that. And get rid of the Sabbath. Nobody needs that. And just add, take care of children. Just protect children. Just add that in. And you will have a much wiser religion. That's what he says. A famous atheist says, what should you remove from the Ten Commandments? The Sabbath. The image stuff. Get rid of that. And add what? Take care of children. This is the Qur'an's version of the Ten Commandments. Do you see the Sabbath here? No. And you know what's been added? Don't kill children and don't take the money of the orphan. 
What is that? Protection of what? Children. And then he says, that would be a much wiser religion. And at the end of this passage, Allah says, this is what Allah revealed from hikmah, from wisdom. He didn't even know he was talking about the Qur'an. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the, the Christian perspective briefly. Doesn't need a long discussion. Simply you should know, the Christians started believing that the law, the law is unnecessary. They believe that Jesus came and his sacrifice, he sacrificed himself. God sacrificed his only son. And the reason he sacrificed himself or his son is so that through his blood, all of our sins are paid for. And therefore, all of us have become pure through the blood of Jesus. That's their belief. Okay. They say that before Jesus, you had to obey the law of Allah. The law given, the kitab was given to who? Moses. They say before Jesus, you had to obey the law to become pure. You, ha you had to obey the law to become pure. But now that Jesus came and his blood has been spilled, his blood purified us. So since we're already pure, we don't need the what? We don't need the law. So all that Christianity is not about the book and the wisdom. It's only about what? The wisdom. You understand? For the Jews, what they did was when Isa salam brought wisdom, they basically declared Isa salam a murtad. They declared him a non-Muslim, somebody who left Islam, somebody who committed blasphemy, somebody who committed, they even accused him of adultery, and that's why he should be killed. Okay? So they denied what part? They denied hikmah. So the Christians denied kitab, and the Jews denied Hikmah. You understand? Now, they got so extreme, the Christians got so extreme, they said, Jesus was actually Hikmah itself walking around. Jesus was Hikmah itself walking around. Now, what does the Quran do? The Quran comes along, along and says, no, Jesus was not Hikmah, Jesus was given Hikmah. Just corrects it just a little bit, changes everything. Then the Quran does something more. The Jews say, we have kitab. The Christians say, we have hikmah. The Quran says, Allah taught Isa alayhi salam the kitab and the hikmah and the Torah and the Injil. So now Isa alayhi salam, according to the Quran, both has kitab and has hikmah. But the focus even in the Quran is on the hikmah part. Let's now understand how that works. This is, I'm going to read this to you and then I'll give you a break. Jesus' reform of Jewish law is presented in Christian discourse as a return to the Decalogue, which in turn equated with natural law and patristic writings and hikmah in the Qur'an. Basically what this means is, Jesus brought hikmah to the law. Sum summary, Jesus brought what to the law? Hikmah, okay? Jesus came with hikmah to clarify the dispute the Israelites had fallen into regarding Moses' kitab. For example, the, the Jews came up with a law because the, the synagogue or the, the temple, which is their haram, in Jerusalem, right? The temple deserves 10% of your seeds, the seeds that you grow, the crop that you grow. 10% of it must go to what? The temple. They came up with this fatwa. When they came up with this fatwa, then they started debating, uh, well, you should be giving to your parents also, and you should be given to the temple also. Then they created, and the, Musa alayhi salam says, in the Torah, Musa says, you have to be good to your parents. Your parents' rights come priority. That's clear to them. But their fatwa said, no, no, no. But what if you have to give to the temple and the temple needs it? If the temple needs it, then even if you have to take the part that you are going to give to your parents and you also give that where? The temple, that's okay. And Jesus says, you can't do that. You can't override the book of Allah and come up with your own fatwa and you act like the, the book Allah revealed and the ayat Allah revealed don't count. Then they did, the, 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 I told you 10% of the seed had to be Used And the, the, the scholars of Judaism at the time of Isa salam, they were called the Pharisees. They were the muftis of Bani Israel. They were the muftis. And they basically came up with this idea, which seeds should we give? Is it all the seeds? Is it wheat seeds, grain seeds, rice seeds? Which ones are we supposed to give to the temple and which ones we don't have to give? And they're trying to come up with exceptions, right? And Isa salam tells them, 
you keep debating which seeds you should give and which seeds you should not give. You should have, pre and, and what you forget is just justice, mercy, faithfulness. By the way, when he's saying justice, mercy, and faithfulness, is he talking about kitab or is he talking about hikmah? He's talking about hikmah. He's saying, you are so obsessed with kitab and you forget all about what? Hikmah. And then he says, you should have practiced the latter, meaning you should have practiced kitab without neglecting the former, without neglecting hikmah. Now, why is this important for us? Because what happens is some people say, how high are your pants? How long is your beard? Let me check. I, I brought a beard measure. And they have a laser pointer. They can like, tell you back row. Your beard's not long enough. You're the, and they're, they're checking every little detail, right? And uh, uh, when they get super, super, super technical, then people around them, their family gets annoyed. Like these people are just, they're fatwafying everything. And then the other extreme happens, you know, these people, they can have their beards and their hijabs and their zabiha meat or whatever. I just want to be a good person. I'm kind. I don't not mean to anybody. I'm good in my business. I take care of my family. I, you know, I don't cut a red light. I take care of animals. I give charity. I follow. So you know what happens? Some Muslims say, it's all about the kitab. And other Muslims say, yeah, you kitab people are just extreme mulvis. It's all about the what? Hikmah. It's all about the hikmah. Even within the Muslims, what do you get? People of kitab and people of hikmah. And what did Jesus do? He told the Pharisees, you people are getting obsessed with the kitab while neglecting the hikmah. You should have observed the kitab and the hikmah. What did Ibrahim salam say? The Prophet will come and teach what? They were supposed to be together. They were supposed to be together. But what happened in the, in the Israelites, what happened among them is kitab and hikmah became separate. And what I'm going to try to show you is if we just contemplate what happened with us, it's separated within us too. Those two things parted within us too, okay? I hope you guys enjoyed that video clip. My team and I have been working tirelessly to try to create as many resources for Muslims to give them first steps in understanding the Qur'an all the way to the point where they can have a deep, profound understanding of the Qur'an. We are students of the Qur'an ourselves and we want you to be students of the Qur'an alongside us. Join us for this journey on BayinaTV.com where thousands of hours of work have already been put in and don't be intimidated, it's step by step by step so you can make learning the Qur'an a part of your lifestyle. There's lots of stuff available on YouTube but it's all over the place. If you want an organized approach to studying the Qur'an beginning to end for yourself, your kids, your family and even among peers, that would be the way to go. Sign up for BayinaTV.com.